So now that we saw an application, let's go ahead and play around with the loss function. And let's go back to Wasserish trying GANs and try to improve it, try to improve its training process. Let's recap what GANs was doing. This is GANs. You have a discriminator, which is discriminating between real and fake images. And then you have a generator that you're training. And X tilde here is just G of Z. Z you are sampling from a normal, from a simple distribution. And then we learned that this is going to give you the Jensen channel divergence. And then we saw that if you use the original objective, you're going to have trouble converging because this is going to saturate at least initially during training. So let's just change that. Rather than minimizing that objective with respect to G, let's maximize with respect to G, and this is your new objective function. That's GANs, and this we covered. This was a quick recap because I want you to compare the math in one slide. This was Wasserish Strain GAN. We know that it was related to the earth mover distance. You had uh, the intuition for the earth mover distance, or at least where the name is coming from, is because you are transporting mass from one distribution to the other distribution. And you want it to have the minimum cost. And the cost is mass times the transpose distance, the transport distance. And mass here is your probability or probability distribution. Mathematically, let's use the same notation. Previously, we were using F. Let's use D to see the similarity between the two objectives. Here, this was a discriminator. Now you're going to call it a critic because this is not a discriminator anymore. This is not going to give you probabilities as output. Now you can see that you are getting rid of the log in this new objective. The first term is the first is the same as the the first term of the first term up there. Basically, you can rename log of d to be your new d, and then this plus is changing into a minus, maybe because you have a minus here, so that plus is turning into a minus, and then you are getting the log. You are getting rid of the log. So these two objective functions are very similar, and you are getting rid of the sigmoid and the log in your Wasserish trying can. But then you had a catch here. This D was the space of Lipschitz continuous functions. So D is a set of one Lipschitz functions. And one is the Lipschitz continuity constant. And in the original paper, we know, we know that this is a big problem. In neural networks, it's a little bit hard to enforce Lipschitz continuity. Maybe one ad hoc method is to clip the weights of the critic to be inside a, box, inside a box that you choose. But then it's not going to be one Lipschitz, it's going to be K Lipschitz. The idea here is that you're going to use gradient penalty. There is this theorem in the paper, and it's actually not there. It, the theorem is not theirs. They're borrowing it from another paper in the literature. And what does it say? It says that if you have a differentiable function, and we know that neural networks are differentiable, OK? It is going to be one Lipschitz if and only if, so this is a two-sided, it's going to be one Lipschitz if it has gradients, because this is where you're going to need the differentiability. If it's differentiable, you're going to know its gradients. They are going to have a norm at, that is as big as one, at most as big as one. Okay, perfect. Now you have a theorem that you can use. If you have a differentiable function, it is going to be one Lipschitz if and only if it has gradients with norm that is at most one everywhere. Let's use that. This is your original critic loss function. This is what you have up there. And then here you're going to put a gradient penalty. You don't want the norm because you, you need to have a norm. You don't want the norm of the gradients of your critic to become bigger than one. So that's a penalty. Actually, this penalty is trying to make all of them as close as possible to one. Okay. You put a gradient penalty with some penalty parameter. And now this is trying to enforce the Lipschitz continuity using this theory. So you're modifying your loss function slightly. And you might wonder, what is this X tilde? X tilde are coming from the generator. X is coming from the real data distribution. And uh, this X hat is just uh, a linear interpolation between the two. It's a random. Uh, point between these two points. So you're enforcing it on that. You have the real data, you have, you have the real data, you have the generated data, and you have a bunch of data in between where you are enforcing this objective. 
Okay, it says that uh, the previous method, clipping the weights of the gradient, is trying to modify the architecture of your neural network by clipping the weights. This one is not modifying the architecture of the neural network. It is just penalizing. If your neural network during training is violating the one Lipschitz continuity property, you're going to penalize it in an indirect fashion through this theory. Why is this penalty two-sided? Shouldn't you just penalize nor uh, gradient norms that are greater than one? Yes, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. Uh, but then that's going to be hard to enforce it. At least this one, it's easier to enforce. Basically, what you're saying is that if the gradient of this uh, critic is approximately equal to one, then uh, this is going to be at most one. Sometimes it's going to go above. Sometimes it's going to go below but then it's going to be approximately equal to one. And then uh, you're going to use this theorem, go backward, and that's going to be one Lipschitz. So it's not the entire family of Lipschitz fun functions. It's just uh, the ones whose gradients are equal to one. But then at least this is the intuition. You want mm -hmm. it to be approximately equal to one according to this theorem. So you are not respecting this theorem line by line. You are respecting it uh, approximately, okay? Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. So I guess um, I guess if empirically it performs just as well, that makes sense. But yes. uh, intuitively, I could also simply take the max of the uh, norm minus one and zero, and then that would be one-sided. You're right. But then the problem with using such functions such as max, et cetera, is that they are not differentiable. So you want your objective function to be nice as well. OK, so it that answers my question. So yeah, it's one matter to write a loss function, and it's another matter for the loss function to be trainable. Now, this is a loss function that is trainable. I'm not saying max is not going to be trainable, but then it's going to have maybe it's going to have a harder time converging. Okay. I'm still um, confused about this x um, hat thing. The the sampling uniformly along straight lines between x and x tilde. So yeah, the question is where are you going to enforce this? Because you want this to be almost everywhere. You cannot sample your entire space because that's going to be too big. Remember, these are high dimensional images. Uh -huh. You're not going to be able to sample the entire space. You want to compute this expectation in an efficient way. Maybe the efficient way is just look at the line between the real example that you just saw and uh -huh. the generated example, and then look at the line between the two. Just sample, do your expectation on that line. Got it. Otherwise, the space is too big. It's not going to be possible to span the entire space. Yeah. Okay, I think we are finishing right on time. For those of you who want to leave, you can leave. And for those of you who want to stay and ask questions, I'll be around. I had a question on the previous slide. Um, I don't know if you can go back to that just so I can. So I, I understand like with these loss functions, I sort of, I understand each individual one, but I'm a little confused how they're sort of being pieced together. Um, it, it seems like we have this, this first loss function, which is LSR, and then we're defining LSR up to the right. But what, how does this like regular GAN loss function fit into that that you have below on the left here? Okay. Mm -hmm. This uh, GAN loss function here is going to help you train D. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's for training D. Once you know D, you're going to be able to train G. And that's this last function here. The LSR gen is exactly what you have up there as well. Okay. Okay. So that part is clear. The generative part is clear mm -hmm. with some coefficient. You're just multiplying and weighting it properly. Now mm -hmm. the question is, what is this? You have multiple options for that. You can mm -hmm. use MSE. You can use BGG. Yeah. And that part makes sense to me. So with this bottom left loss function, we're just looking at training theta D and then exactly. that will give us this. And then once we start training theta G, that will be this LSR gen. Exactly. It's going to give you that. Okay. Uh, and by the way, you're not going to train this all the way. You're going to do partial training. So you're going to do a sequential training. You train G for a bunch of iterations, then you train D, then you train G, etc. Mm -hmm. And hopefully by the end of the training, you have the last function that you need out of D. Okay. Okay. Cool. The perfect scenario would have been to train D perfectly, 
per each sample that you generate or per each iteration that you update the parameters of your G. But then it's not feasible. Mm -hmm. So you're going to do the consecutive training. You train that for a bunch of iterations, then, the, then you train the other guy. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, sure.